Hello, everybody. I'm Dan Dunsky, the executive producer of The Agenda with Steve Pakin, TVO's flagship current affairs uh, program. And I'm joined today by, as always, by Janice Stein, the founding director of the Monk School for International Studies and TVO's very own foreign affairs analyst. Hello, Janice. Good afternoon to you, Dan. Uh, Janice, so we're going to talk today about the story that, frankly, the whole world is talking about, and that is Iran's uh, nuclear program and the uh, apparent framework agreement that was agreed to last week and subsequent to that what's been happening this week with regards to that agreement. Um, last week we heard that the Western powers and Iran had agreed to a framework agreement to place limits on Iran's nuclear program. So before we get into what's happened since then, and I know that a lot has, why don't you start off by telling us what we thought had been agreed to last week? So there are five dimensions of this um, that are really important and almost instantaneously within an hour of the announcement, uh, the United States and Iran issued fact sheets and the disagreements became obvious in what they call the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. So what are these five? We can run through them quite quickly. The first of these is the duration of the limits on Iran's enrichment program. So everybody agrees that Iran, one, will continue to enrich, and two, that there will be limits on that enrichment. That there's no dispute about. It. But how long will Iran be limited in its capacity to enrich? The United States said 15 years and sometimes 10, and Iran said maximum 10 years and then this agreement becomes null and void. So if you accept the Iranian interpretation, after 10 years, all the provisions on restrictions lapse. Secondly, Iran has enriched uranium up to 20%. They agreed that there would be a 3.5% limit, and that's a significant reduction. You cannot really make uh, a nuclear bomb with uranium that's enriched to 3.5%. But the question is what happens to the uranium that was enriched to 20%? Well, the Iranians say we will dilute it. Uh, uh, the Americans say that it will have to be reduced to 300 kilograms and uh, the enriched uranium will have to be monitored. So we, should, we should just point out one thing, Janice, sorry to interrupt you, but 20% is also not what's known as weapons grade, weapons grade uranium, but it is easier to get from 20 to, I believe, 90%. Uh, it's, it, it's, it's faster to get from 20 to 90% than it is to get from 3.5 to 20%. Is that right? The hard trip is to get from 3.5% to 20%, which is where Iran got to. To get to 90% is not technically challenging at all, and it's quite quick. Okay. Uh, and, and it's that, by the way, which led President Obama to say they're three months away uh, from developing a nuclear weapon because they have successfully enriched to 20%. The third thing is the fate of the centrifuges. And this is a complicated issue, but the big picture here is Iran has fundamentally early generation centrifuges and is doing research and development on later generation centrifuges. What they both agreed to is that Iran would keep some centrifuges. The hope had been originally by some that Iran would give them up. That's off the table and both the United States and Iran agreed to that. But the question is, what do they mean? The United States said limited research on this latest generation centrifuge. The Iranians say no, continued research and development of these very advanced centrifuges that can come online 10 years from now and spin and enrich very, very quickly. Fourth issue, of course, is a Ronald Reagan issue, verification modeling. And this is a big one. Uh, Iran agreed uh, to sign what is called the additional protocol of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, which provides for intrusive inspections. Uh, the United States said that Iran has agreed to intrusive inspections and beyond surprise inspections. Ayatollah Khamenei weighed in 
and said there will be no inspections of military sites. Now that frankly is a flashing red light because it then makes possible to take um, um, nuclear development out of the existing facilities, move it off site into a military encampment, and it's difficult then for the inspectors to get in. And the last big one, sanctions relief, which is critically important to Iran. Iran said, and uh, President Rouhani, uh, where's the voice here, sanctions will be lifted. All the sanctions will be lifted the day the agreement is signed. The United States said no. The sanctions will be lifted very gradually as Iran continues to comply with these agreements and we are preserving the capacity to snap them back on. Now, when he said that, uh, just a quick question on the sanctions. Uh, there's some confusion to add to the confusion about which sanctions people are talking about because there are both United Nations sanctions and then there are various countries which have placed individual national sanctions, if you will, uh, their own international sanctions on Iran. Is it clear who was talking about which sanctions? So these negotiations were done by the P5 plus Germany, which means the permanent five, those with a veto in the Security Council. United States, Britain, France, China, Russia, plus Germany. So the agreement means that those countries will lift their sanctions, those six countries, and that United Nations sanctions would be lifted. Okay. So we were talking about both sanctions. All right, so let me get back to you. you no you've, agreement on the timing. Oh, no, I get that. So here's my question. You've, outla you've laid out very effectively the five areas, the key areas, frankly, to the framework uh, agreement and the, the differing interpretations. So uh, maybe I'm old fashioned, but when I hear the word agreement, I tend to think that there's two sides or more that have actually agreed to something. So are we to think that in fact, there was no agreement last week? There was no agreement. What the document was called actually, the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. So it was a plan, it was never meant to be an agreement. And the understanding was that we would take the next three months till the end of June to negotiate the agreement. Now, why do we get this announcement now? Uh, and we got this announcement because Congress in the United States signed an acceptable agreement by the end of March, they would reimpose sanctions. So that increased the pressure on all the parties to announce. Uh, in terms of a negotiating strategy, um, this is what you do not want to do. You do not want both parties to walk away from the table with differing understandings of what they'd agreed to. The United States wanted to write it down. Uh, President Rouhani did not want to write it down. He was adamant that it not be written down. And each of them were thinking about their own domestic constituencies and the problems they would have at home selling. So did we not get a single joint communique signed by all the parties? There is no written text that came out of Switzerland last week. There are only fact sheets that the United States issued, that Iran issued, and those fact sheets diverge on really crucial areas. I, I can say, having watched this process, and what you're actually seeing is you are seeing uh, Iran and the United States walk back from the notion that there's a shared understanding, that the challenges of getting to a shared agreement that is written down are major. Uh, and a process like this makes it less rather than more likely. So you're, you, you have significant, you are critical of the process that was undertaken here. Not necessarily of the process to try to get some kind of agreement, but the way it was done. Uh, very critical, and frankly, uh, I understand the pressures that were acting on the president, but once Rouhani said he would not write anything down, they would have been better off announcing that they reached an agreement in principle, that they would not disclose, and that they would send their best negotiators to the table for the next three months and work on it, and that there would be a, a total blackout until that happened. Uh, this is a recipe for a catastrophe, frankly. 
All right. So now let's start picking uh, uh, some of what you, you brought up apart, because um, I, I, I think that, uh, as you said, it started, it, it started almost immediately being walked back. Um, and interestingly enough, there, uh, there are credible voices on both sides here that are arguing this is I don't think anybody is saying this is a good deal. Uh, what people are saying is that this is the least possible, possibly the least bad outcome that could have uh, that could have emerged from these talks. So uh, you've got yeah, that's so you've the, got, you've, the agreement are arguing, and with you know, um, with some reason that the alternative to this was an escalating conflict, possibly war. Uh, in a region that is on fire, frankly, and that this was the best possible deal that they could get under the circumstances. Now, there are critics who say that's a false choice, right? The choice is not between disagreement and war. The, the choice is tighten the sanctions. Uh, the sanctions actually brought Iran to the table and hang tough for a better agreement. I'm dubious that um, the agreement could be much better than it is. And we saw President Rouhani start to walk it back almost immediately. There were really tight domestic constraints operating on both the United States and Iran right now. So let's take it that this was the best possible agreement. All right. Uh, so, so, so despite that, you had some pretty serious criticisms uh, emerging uh, this week, at, even as it was being, being walked back, but even before it was, it, it reached the point where we are today, most specifically, um, I think that um, uh, we heard uh, earlier this week that uh, Henry Kissinger and George Shultz, two former secretaries of state, who carry a lot of weight on diplomatic matters, um, if I can summarize what they had to say, quote, negotiations to prevent an Iranian capability to develop a nuclear arsenal are ending with an agreement that concedes this very capability. So you already, even before it had been walked back to the point that we're at today, uh, criticisms of this deal were coming fast and furious. There's no question. Uh, so just to take the, the argument that Kissinger and Schultz made, uh, fundamentally, uh, e this agreement explicitly recognizes the right of Iran to enrich for peaceful purposes, and at the very most kicks this down the road by 15 years and then recognizes the right of Iran to continue to enrich. So it's a fair criticism that a president who started this process by saying, I will never allow Iran uh, to develop a nuclear weapon is now really saying the United States will not allow Iran to develop a nuclear weapon for the next 15 years if you take the most optimistic reading um, of what will come out of this process. And that's a change, there's no question. And not only that, but I think that um, in, in a moment of, of candor that he per perhaps wishes he could take back, Obama, President Obama during the, the interview with NPR conceded that at the end of the 10 or 15 year period, uh, Iran would be within three months or almost immediately able to put together a bomb, that it could do so perfectly uh, in quotation marks, legally, and without having any uh, any recourse that the uh, against it that the the rest of the world currently has, that's yeah. that that's a tough sell. Well, you know that was um, an extraordinary interview that he gave when he said that, and uh, his spokesperson, Josh Nurse, was quick quick to clarify almost immediately that he meant if there were no deal. But that's really difficult to believe, frankly, because he was quite explicit. He said in the 12th and 13th year, which really suggests that he's talking about within the framework of this agreement. So you have to take what he said seriously. But let's look at the at the fact sheet, as we say. We have a president who is now saying today, March 2015, Iran is no more than three months away from being able to build a bomb. So it is a threshold nuclear state. 13 years from now, Iran will be no longer, no more than three months away from building a bomb. Uh, so 13 years from now will not be materially worse than it is right this minute, with one exception, that the normative pressure uh, on Iran not to do this will be much weaker. And 
uh, the sanctions uh, will be extraordinarily difficult to reimpose. There is no such thing as snapping back sanctions. So, uh, in other, so in other words, the difference is that the, 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 you pointed out the normative uh, part of it, but uh, the, 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 the P5 plus one lose the leverage that they currently have. So the, 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 time, the time may be the same, the breakout period may be the same, but the, the leverage that the West right now, uh, I shouldn't call it the West because there are some non-Western countries in there. Yeah. That's right. Uh, the, that, that those that are arrayed against Iran right now, um, they lose the leverage that they have. That's right. And so what are you getting? I think that's a fair way to think about this. They will have much less leverage 13 or 14 years than they have now to stop weaponization. On the other hand, um, Iran will be 12 or 13 years into this process. There will be hopefully strong interests uh, inside Iran that have benefited from the lifting of sanctions. There will be greater engagement hopefully the society will be more open than it is today and there may be less pressure to weaponize uh 13 years from now than there is today that's frankly the gamble okay so that that is where i wanted to go next because you, you hit you hit it exactly you hit the nail on the head i suppose that the gamble is as you say that over the next 10 to 15 years should this agreement go through uh, Iran would come to the realization that it has far more to gain by sticking to the by sticking to the rules uh, than it does in uh, forfeiting the agreement and, uh, and 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 trying again to ratchet up its nuclear program. That's a big if. Do we have any sense? D whether it's historical evidence, whether it's evidence of, um, when I mean historical, I mean of other states that have tried to uh, develop nuclear programs uh, or tried to develop nuclear weapons. And I do think that it is fair to say that there are very few people, very few countries or their intelligence services who believe that Iran is not trying to develop nuclear weapons. Um, or is there anything in the makeup of the regime itself that suggests that this is or is not a good gamble to take? So what do we know um, from the past? And you're quite right um, that the number of countries who've tried to develop nuclear weapons is not large. But we do have um, some interesting cases where countries did walk back from their nuclear programs and they were on the verge of weaponization. So South Africa was one. Uh, when did South Africa do that? When it wanted very much to be part of the international system. It walked its nuclear program back and gave it up. Gaddafi in Libya walked back from a nuclear program that many suspected was, in fact, a concealed weaponization program. Now, you're looking back, you have to ask whether he made the, the best decision for himself personally, but nevertheless, he did walk that program back. And again, it was after the invasion of Iraq. And for him, that decision was primarily about repairing his relationships with Britain and the United States and making sure that he was not a target for regime change. Uh, Brazil uh, walked back, and Brazil walked back even though it had uh, conflicts in its own region, but it walked back when a more liberal, trade-oriented coalition took power. And one of the benefits, the economic benefits of engagement with the world and therefore made the decision that the benefits that a nuclear weapons program would give them were not worth the cost of being shut out of the economic system. So we do have examples like that done, but I don't, I think, it's, you know, that's, it's very difficult to generalize from those to a very different regime uh, in a different part of the world, and that's why I describe it as a gamble. And of course, we have the the counter example of North Korea, yes. which may actually be a more apt example, given its isolation, uh, given the nature of its regime. Obviously, not a theocratic regime, but some sim some some similarities in in uh, in a. a some a greater degree of similarities, uh, perhaps, in, uh, in in that example than there would be to South Africa, Brazil. Uh, I can't speak about Libya, but also Argentina. 
So, you know, the North Korean case, of course, is one that is cited all the time because if that's the case where a framework agreement was reached, uh, it wasn't disputed. Uh, it was um, the Bush administration then didn't really take it forward. The relationship between North Korea and the United States remained very cold and North Korea fundamentally renounced the agreement and proceeded to develop nuclear weapons. So that's the nightmare scenario. And uh, I don't think anybody can say with assurance that Iran will not follow that road. But there is a big difference. There are big differences between Iran and North Korea. The most important is that um, Iran is much more um, anxious to become part of the global economy. It has a large merchant and trading class uh, that predates this regime. Uh, that remembers a period of greater openness. It actually has quite a vigorous civil society, which North Korea does not have. Uh, it, so it's a much richer, uh, more textured country than North Korea is, which has never had, uh, you know, for 50, 60 years now has, has had uh, a repressive regime in place. So I think it's hard to generalize from the North. It's as hard to generalize from the North Korean case as it is from the South African, the Libyan, or the Brazilian case. Okay, so let's move on then. Uh, with just a few minutes left, Janice, I did want to ask you, given you, given the fact that you have quite a few contacts in the Middle East, what you are hearing from them, uh, from your contacts in Egypt, from your contacts in uh, Jordan, um, uh, in Saudi Arabia, and in Israel, as to what's been going on in those countries and among the leaderships in those countries in the past week. So you mentioned four countries that are all deeply unhappy and opposed to this agreement. Um, Saudi Arabia sees this as the ascendance of Shia Iran uh, in the region. Uh, it is currently involved in virtually in a proxy war in Yemen. Uh, against what it considers to be Iran-supported Houthis. It cannot comprehend why the United States is doing this. Uh, the Saudi monarchy is utterly mystified by this and never misses an opportunity to tell President Obama what a terrible uh, decision he's making. And it's actually Saudi Arabia. If this agreement goes forward, uh, it is the likeliest candidate of any country in the region to actually begin a nuclear program of its own. Egypt and Jordan, uh, bitterly unhappy with this. Again, as you know, Egypt, the largest Sunni country uh, in the region, uh, it once had a nuclear program under President Nasser, uh, and uh, it was shut down, uh, largely because the cost was beyond what Egypt could afford at the time, and it was a technological challenge. You hear mutterings from the Egyptian military. Um, the depth of their unhappiness is difficult to exaggerate. Israel's unhappiness is open. Uh, Israel's pursued a negotiating strategy, which is also difficult to understand. Uh, President, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu opposed vigorously, took, to, you know, took his opposition to Congress and just opposed any deal that would allow any enrichment to continue in Iran. And not until this joint comprehensive plan of action was announced did his minister bring forward seven or eight objections, concrete objections and modifications uh, to the deal. And frankly, uh, they're not likely to meet with any success because the parties are busy walking it back rather than walking it forward. So you have very, very deep unhappiness in the heartland of the Middle East about this agreement. I think they hope it fails. And, uh, and just, uh, that will be my last question to ask you to speculate as to whether or not you believe it will. But just on the question of, uh, on the point of Israel, we should point out that it is not just uh, the Likud that is opposed to this deal. Um, there seems to be quite universal opposition to this deal in Israel. I note that, uh, a man of the left, uh, a man from Peace Now, uh, Ari Shavit, the, uh, the the columnist at Haaretz, just wrote a column yesterday or, or this morning, I can't remember which one, where he, I believe it was yesterday, where he was bitterly critical of this deal, uh, effectively calling Obama naive 
for his uh, his sense of politics in the Middle East. You know, I would describe him as a man of the center, actually, yes. but he he used the strongest possible language, um, and and in, in a sense, uh, you know, apocalyptic language, literally about the consequences of this agreement. And I, I, what is not in dispute here, and I think everybody needs to understand this, is that 15 years from now, there will be no restrictions in place um, on Iran proceeding to weaponize its nuclear program. And that's, of course, what he wrote about. Uh, and bitterly disappointed in Obama. You know, his line was, Obama promised there would never be a nuclear weapon. Well, never means until January 2017 when he leaves office. And that's too short a time. Okay, Janice, one last question. Um, is the deal dead? The deal is in deep trouble. Um, and why is the deal in deep trouble? There is so much opposition to it uh, inside the United States inside Iran. Uh, you know, the Republican guards, the leaders of the Republican guards clearly do not like this deal and are taking their cue only from Ayatollah Khamenei. Um, and so they're holding their fire, but at the slightest opportunity, they will come out strongly against this. The fact that they now have to negotiate in public for the next three months, that each side has staked out its position and the disagreements are obvious and to get to an agreement now, they're gonna to have to compromise in public, makes it extraordinarily difficult uh, to reach an agreement. I have to say, you know, professionally, it's a very poorly designed process to reach an agreement, no matter what the domestic pressure is, uh, it is setting uh, the P5 plus one and Iran up for failure. That's Janice Stein, the founding uh, director of the Monk School and uh, a terrific explainer of international affairs. Janice, thanks very much. Nobody does it better. Thank you very much. Always a pleasure. I'm Dan Dunsky and uh, thanks very much for watching. See you next time.